Three, two, one. This is The Jungle, an up-close, unvarnished look inside leadership and business strategy. We wade into the real world leader's face and explore what they do to create a path forward because that's what business is. Wild, exciting, it's The Jungle. Derek, happy new year back in the jungle. Yeah, happy new first podcast of the new year, Doc. Is, how, was, how, are the, how, are the, how are the holidays for you? Well, uh, holidays, you know, a lot of work get, get, got done during the holidays. Uh, a lot of reading. I find a chance to do a lot of reading and I spent a ton of time with my kids. You, you, were, um, you were all about the, uh, the, new, the new Jeff Bezos book. Do you have a takeaway you want to share with listeners from that book? Uh, go read it. Yeah. Uh, his, he hasn't changed his tune since his first letter that was in the first page of the first paragraph, his first letter to shareholders. And it's the same philosophy he's had. And it's, it's really sober in philosophy. It's great. Great read. Go read it. Okay. Okay. Uh, cash would, flows. Bottom line, acquire, right? What's most important? Long-term free cash flows, period. Well, speaking, speaking of uh, acquire, we're in a new year, 2021. What is, what, what are you most excited about this year, Derek? Lots of things going on. Yeah. I'm excited about, uh, we had a big year in 2020 and 2021 is going to be even bigger. A lot of, a lot of initiatives. We got to pare some of those down. We got to prioritize some stuff. Uh, but, you know, I think this is uh, the acquire and sleeping giant capital and, and some of the rebranding is going to get to a whole new level. Uh, and we're going to, you know, ha- have, have, have some fun and do some impactful work. How about you, Doug? How are holidays? What, what, uh, Holidays were good, you know, uh, good to take some time off and, and recoup. That was a, that was a, a, an intense 2020. We got a lot of success. Uh, you know, people say, I don't know, they probably say to you, Derek, how was, how was, you know, how was 2020? And you know, like for us professionally, it's, it was fantastic. We had a, we had a great, great year. Uh, so good, good time with the family. Uh, glad everybody's back at school though. It's, a, it, it's, it's, it's nice to see, have them around. And then it's nice to get back in the routine. Uh, you know, 2021, I'm, I'm excited I think we're going to have an acquisition or two this this year out of the fund. Uh, really excited for that to to really take our model to the next level, and uh, I'm really excited about some of the conversations we're having with um, businesses and other folks in our community here in West Michigan. Uh, yep. It's a great time for listeners. You want to get involved um, on a consulting project with our LBS program. You're thinking about selling your business. Uh, you're thinking about buying a business or we have our acquire class or cohort coming through here in February. Uh, really excited. We're doing some stuff with Kalamazoo County schools, uh, some students from Ireland. So great time to be closely connected to our community, making an impact uh, with our students. So I think that's probably the, uh, the most exciting thing for 2021. And, and, and I'm excited so far in 2021 that we've had like no snow, no snow this year in Michigan. Yeah, it's a very light, a very light snow year in Michigan. So that's that's uh, always a, always I, a fan. I, I'm not a fan. I, when it's cold, I want snow. I'm Canadian. You're I want Canadian. Snow. I take my kids skiing and to the, to the outdoor rinks and stuff. But uh, none of that's none of that's flying this year. So. Well, we had we had uh, speaking of of a great 2021. Uh, we had a great first episode here with uh, uh, a great guest. Uh, we had on the podcast uh, today, uh, Michael Doss, who is the president and CEO of Graphic Packaging Company. He's been CEO since uh, January 2016. Uh, what is really amazing is he started off with graphic packaging in 1990. Uh, and so graphic packaging, we know well here in Kalamazoo, uh, they do a lot of uh, paper and packaging uh, specifically for food and uh, and beverage products, fortune 500 company headquartered down in Atlanta. And I, and, and on top of all that, a great Bronco, Uh, Michael Doss is a, is a two-time graduate, I believe of the uh, Western Michigan university and the Hayworth college of business. Uh, So a fortune 500 CEO on the podcast, great Bronco, uh, we had a great conversation with him. Uh, what were your takeaways, Derek? Yeah. So great Bronco, right. And, and climbing, climbing the corporate ladder all the way to the top, starting at the bottom, climbing the top. So it's a great, great guest to have on. He's also super humble still, which is nice to see, uh, loves his time at Western, which is, which is great. All that great. So my takeaway is, uh, you know, given 2020 and 2021, he said adaptability is probably the most important thing for him that has been. Uh, I kind of like that. Uh, you know, that, that was a great takeaway. I, I'm going to give you his, uh, uh, 
analogy you used uh, from sports because you know you and I both played some sports growing up is is every year is like making a new team if you look at it that way every single year you gotta it's a new team you gotta make the team and you gotta you gotta perform uh, and and to be able to perform every year with all the changes you gotta be adaptable uh, so I, I thought that was a you know a great takeaway he talked about you know how he is a CEO and what that means of a fortune 500 company uh, so it's just, I thought that was critical for our time, right? Uh, especially what's happened in higher ed and, and what we're going through. You got to adapt fast now. Yeah. What was your takeaway, Doug? Yeah. So uh, a great Bronco to me, uh, you know, to your point, you know, here's someone who is uh, a, a great graduate, proud graduate of WMU Hayworth, Western Michigan University, now the CEO of a fortune 500 company. And, you know, he talked about, I don't know if it was on the podcast or if it before or after, but the, the, the scrappiness and the, the humility and the resilience of our students that they can do great things. I think he's a great example for all of our students that you come through WMU Hayworth, you, you, you apply yourself, get after it. You can, you can be a CEO, be a CEO of a fortune 500 company. So a really, really great example for um, our university. For me, it was all about sustainability. Uh, that's a big conversation these days. And uh, the, the notion of what you want to deliver to the customer, creating value for your, your customer, sustainability is what people want to see, uh, but that there's also some really great business advantages of, of sustainability. They're, they're investing in, I, I think he said a $600 million facility here in Kalamazoo, which is a big bet. That's a recycling a, mill, right? For packaging. Yep. Big that's bet. A, that's a Good big for bet. Kalamazoo. Um, and you can, and I, I, what I loved is uh, this, this notion of, um, you can take these, what they do and recycle it seven times and, and still be able to use that packaging. But I think it shows that sustainability is something uh, we haven't had really touched on that maybe in the podcast before, but sustainability is a part of the of business strategy as a part of the bets that companies are going to make. Um, and great, great that he has it here in, in Kalamazoo uh, to impact our, our community and jobs. So uh, Fantastic guest. Uh, we hope everybody enjoys this episode with Mike Doss, CEO of Graphic Packaging. The Jungle is produced by the Center for Principal Leadership and Business Strategy in Western Michigan University's Hayworth College of Business. Our center supports the leadership and business strategy major, conducts large-scale consulting projects, and trains professionals in acquiring and operating small businesses. To learn more, visit wmich.edu forward slash leadership center. Mike, welcome to the jungle. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here today. Cheers. What do you have uh, with your beverage today, Cheers. Mike? A little coffee. <laughs> A little coffee. And you said no, pa- no, no paper cup, though. Yeah, you got to keep that to yourself because we're the largest manufacturer of, full, of uh, paper cups in, in North America. So I should really be drinking it out of a paper cup. Yeah, yeah. Well, Derek, do you want to? Has he seen our? He, you should show him the the Yeti. I don't even know if our listeners have seen the Yeti. We, we have a, a LBS, but maybe we need to get them some some Western branded LBS paper cups or something. I don't know. That could probably help you out with that. It's a big block <laughs> W there. I like it. So, Mike, where, where, uh, for our listeners uh, tuning in who might be not who might be not uh, tuning in on the video part, can you tell us a little bit about where you are uh, joining us on the podcast today? Yeah, so I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. This is where our corporate headquarters are, north side of town, right off of 285 and 75, close to the ballpark. So, uh, as I was sharing with Derek earlier, uh, for many who will be listening in Michigan, you got to love the weather here in Atlanta. What is it like down there right now? Uh, you know, a normal winter day is. Um, probably 55. We get a lot of sun. Um, I'll be able to run in shorts tonight. So that's kind of cool. Um, like most of the listeners, I grew up in Michigan. My first uh, 22 years I was there. And, um, as, I, as I get a little older, uh, not having to, to run outside in the cold is actually kind of nice. Derek, Derek would empathize with that. He's a big, he's a big runner. So he gets the, and a Canadian, so he gets the, he gets the coldness too. <laughs> he moved south a little bit, but he's probably got a little bit more still to go. Uh, yeah, yeah, I need to keep, I need to keep going. I think um, a little bit more. So, so Mike, where, where did where were you uh, born and raised here? You're born and raised in Michigan. Yeah, so I was born and raised in Michigan, uh, Jackson, Michigan. I, I was born, and then uh, my dad worked for the power company, Consumers Energy. So we moved around the state quite a little bit, and then I wound up uh, in 1984 um, uh, starting my undergraduate work at uh, Western Michigan. And so uh, we we did a little preview on your on your background. So a finance major, but yeah. also but also tied into engineering. Seems like a little foreshadowing, maybe to where you where you decided to go. 
Yeah, you know, so my actual undergraduate degree is in industrial marketing, and I've got an MBA from Western as well, and uh, with an emphasis on finance. But uh, I do do a lot of uh, engineering type work, as you can imagine, given we're a, a big manufacturing company. That's great. Uh, and and Fortune 500 CEO, Western grad. Uh, graphics uh, packaging, you guys are doing really important work. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing that's really interesting about your bio, though, going back to your, uh, your history is you've been with this company since 1990. Yeah, uh, celebrated my 30th year with the company this year. 30. Okay, so I, 1990. So I was eight at the time. Yeah. Uh, so so I appreciate it. You know, really, <laughs> I like how you work that in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's an interesting, it's a, I think it's an interesting perspective for, for listeners. Cause we, you know, we've got Stryker here in, in locally and Kellogg mm -hmm. and, and other great, uh, furniture companies up in Grand Rapids, uh, big automotive, obviously lots of big companies here in Michigan. Right. And you've been able to, since 1990, you've had a lot of different roles moving up in that organization. Do you have any lessons you'd want to share on how you do that successfully, uh, trade-offs, good and bad, what, what that's been like? Well, I'll tell you, I really feel like I've worked for four different companies, even though I've been here 30 years, because we've done a number of big mergers and acquisitions that have kind of changed the overall culture and focus of the business. And I think one of the most important things that you have to be able to do is adapt and uh, you know change as things happen, uh, whether that's you know changing jobs and going to a different industry or even within the company you're working in, in my case, um, you know, learning new things, uh, you know, applying that knowledge, uh, you know, differently and, and, and growing into those roles. So I, that's an incredibly important, you know, skill set to be able to have. We, we, we talk a lot about, and you know, it's, the reason the podcast is called The Jungle is after a Ray Dalio quote, uh, you want to live a great, a great life, you got to go through a dangerous jungle and you got to choose to do that. But our, our students picked that up uh, and call, started calling our class The Jungle because you know, we want to put students in these experiences where, there's uncertainty. People don't know the answer. There isn't a right answer. People are trying to figure out maybe what the problem is, what the question is. Uh, so this notion of uh, being adaptive is something we we really resonate with. Is that what, what did what do you what have you learned about being adaptive? What what has helped you become more adaptive as you've done that? I think it actually, in my case, is kind of rooted, uh, you know, as a as a kid playing competitive athletics. I mean. You know, you had to make a team every year. And that's one of my mantras here as CEO. And I really believe it even for myself is that uh, every year we got to get better. You know, so the board of directors has got every right uh, now heading into my sixth year as CEO to expect that I'm going to be a much better CEO today than I was, you know, when I was in my second year. Uh, and I think if you kind of adapt that type of mentality, it doesn't need to be draconian. Um, but on the other side of things, it forces you to you know, learn from your mistakes and, and get better over time. And, and what no matter what job you're doing within the corporation, you know, that's what we have to do. I use the example a lot with uh, when I'm speaking to bigger groups, uh, you know, I just ask the question, who would openly admit that they would go to a doctor who, had, who said that they hadn't learned anything new since 1980? And of course, everybody snickers and laughs and no hands go up in the air. Um, and of course, you want to have the, the, the latest thought processes and the best treatment you can get. And so it's a good analogy that I think really resonates with people around just, you know, continuous improvement and, and learning new things. So the, uh, you're going to go there, Derek? Well, I was just, I was just going to say, so uh, I mean, that could lead us into maybe the situation right now with COVID and, and yeah. the stress in the economy. I, I assume that adaptability has served you well. C can you talk about what it's been like leading yeah. in this uh, stressful environment where remote work and everything is, is, is coming to with so many facilities around um, with graphics packaging? Yeah, thanks for that, Derek. I think, you know, it, it really did come at us quickly. And, and I'm really proud of our organization in terms of how we were able to respond. Um, we basically, over the course of a week, you know, took 1,800 people and turned them into remote workers. Um, now, fortunately, we have a, an excellent IT department, and we were set up with a platform that allowed us to do that. Um, but still, you've got the whole connectivity part of it and, and uh, relationships with people and how the work gets done and how we support customers you know, that had to be worked out in a really quick period of time. Um, and look, there were some hiccups here and there for sure, but for the most part, uh, we were able to kind of navigate it through it because our, our mission our, and our sense of purpose is really clear for our employees. And I think that's one of the things you've got to have, uh, you know, to be a successful company is just a, uh, you know, a, a 
common set of goals and objectives that people really understand up and down in the organization and how we you know, exist to service customers. So, uh, so here's a interesting question. I'm, I'm really curious about uh, your answer to this. So we've gone through the, we're, we're in the middle, we're still in the middle of the pandemic, but there, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we're, we're seeing the vaccine and, and everything else. So, and we've been with this for, I don't even know, is it nine months now, 10 months? Mm-hmm. What are you seeing as as a lasting imprint of the pandemic that is changing how you lead or, yeah. or how you operate as a CEO? So we've le- had a lot of learnings through this. We call them COVID synergies in some ways, taking a negative and turning it into a positive, you know, as we think about it. Um, and some of those in terms of are really tied to how the work gets done here. And we've got real learnings, uh, you know, for me as the CEO in terms of how we can have people working remotely and with more flexibility, they still get their work done in a way that allows us to um, uh, you know, take care of customers, which is our primary purpose for existing as, as both of you know, uh, and yet have them feel really good about the work and feel connected to the work. So on the other side of things, I think remote work works great in the short term and medium term, because again, everybody's kind of banded together. We're going to get through this. It's going to be great. Then you kind of go through the adolescence portion of that and it starts to you know, drain on folks as they're kind of at home and don't have that normal interaction. Um, so we have some people that absolutely want to come back into the work work office, um, uh, either one of our divisional headquarters or our corporate headquarters here in Atlanta. Um, So we're thinking through that, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, And then the other part of that is some of our most senior talented people have really loved working at home. They know their job's cold. They're able to do it really well. Um, I want to enable that. But on the other side of things, I have to have them understand the role they play in helping new employees and what we call our leadership development people, which is our, our, uh, you know, people like who I was when I hired in out of Western in 1990, you know, getting them up to speed in the, and they are just, you know, sources of immense knowledge uh, and, uh, and people, you know, go to them for that kind of insight and advice. And, and I need them to be available beyond just being on a video chat. Uh, a lot of that stuff takes place at the coffee, uh, you know, shop or, you know, uh, you know, sidebar conversations outside a cubicle or in the break room, all those types of things. So I'm thinking about that in the medium term. Um, And we probably end up with an organization that has our more senior people, say director and above, are going to come back into their normal roles in a post-vaccine type setting. And then beyond that is I think about customer service, production control, uh, some of our technical roles, engineering. Uh, We can probably do teams and have a, uh, a, you know, what I'll call a, you know, a green team and a white team. Those are our company colors. Uh, and uh, have them work, you know, two weeks at home, two weeks in the office. We, we've done some surveying. There seems to be a lot of interest in being able to do that. And then we get what we need as an employer. We always have people that know that work in, in the offices. Um, but then we're also able to accommodate a you know, more flexible work schedule, which is you think about being an employer of choice has to be on your mind. Uh, you know, so that's pretty exciting for me to be able to be thinking about. How about you personally? So you're, you're, you're the CEO, you're a CEO of a fortune 500 company. Do you have any lasting changes of how you lead or how you work or how you, that you think, you know what, this is hit the pandemic. I'm, I'm going back to the office. You're, you're in the office right now, but that you're going to really keep as a part of how you work, how you lead that you got from the pandemic personally. So um, I've never been home more than I have been this year since I was 23 years old. Um, my jobs were always heavy travel jobs, seeing customers, seeing operations, you know, and a lot of that was international type work because we're a global company. Um, and so I have not traveled much other than day trips in and out, uh, you know, to visit, uh, you know, certain locations, you know, during this. So um, that's made my wife real happy, which has been great. Um, and our daughter, who lives in New York City, came back for the summer. Um, actually, she came back in April and stayed through the summer. Um, so that was kind of nice. But the biggest learning for me that I was able to do is uh, taking a look at my schedule and some of the travel for some of the industry type stuff, or even some of the lobbying that I do in DC um, and other things like that can be done incredibly effective, uh, you know, in a, in a virtual setting and saves me a lot of travel. I still need to get out and see customers. I still need to get out to our operations and we've got 85 plants around the globe. Um, you know, things don't, you know, as I, I like to tell people, you know, um, the real work doesn't get done in our offices. It gets it gets done out in the field, and uh, 
I still fundamentally believe that, but how I prioritize my time, uh, which is the most valuable commodity I have, as you guys know, um, is going to change. Um, and there's been some great learnings on that. I'll give you another example. Um, we used to record town halls here at the corporate headquarters, had a production team come in, do the video, uh, translate it into, you know, eight or nine different languages that went out across the globe. Um, I'm now able to do these on this screen. Uh, the last one I did uh, you know, a month and a half ago, um, I had 2000 of our employees on it. I have a moderator that helps facilitate questions, but they're, they're in my, looking in my office, um, you know, talking to me real time and the engagement's been incredible. And I think as you've got more of a remote work, people still want that human connection. They still want to feel connected uh, and, uh, you know, I think as you think about those types of things and how you prioritize the tools, you know, that's a big thing. Um, another thing I'd share with you that I've taken more of a slant on here in the last 12 months for sure is, is kind of the social media platform. I mentioned my daughter earlier. She's an expert on that stuff. Dad, not so much. Um, but we fortunately, I've got a good communications team here at Graphic. Uh, that's um, uh, really helped me get connected uh, you know, with some of the platforms there. As you guys well know, uh, younger people tend to use those and even some older ones. Um, you know, uh, and, and it's a great way to get our message out, help us build our brand and help our people stay connected to what we're doing. Okay, so let's uh, now, let, let's talk about packaging uh, and, and the future. Um, you, you know, you, you've got a big uh, project in Kalamazoo that you're, 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 yeah. you're lifting off, um, which is great to see for, for anybody where we live, um, especially for our local economy. But what do you see as, as, as the future of packaging when people have been at home ordering everything, you know, via either online grocery shopping or online shipping? And I think some of that may stay um yeah. wh what do you guys see in there you can drop the think it's going to stay uh, it mm -hmm. um that uh, that trend was uh, you know starting you know prior to the pandemic and it's just accelerated that trend and uh we make uh folding cartons uh, you know largely for food and beverage customers 95 percent of everything we do is you know is food and beverage oriented and as i mentioned earlier we also make paper cups you know for a variety of uh, uh institutional customers um uh, and uh, those, so what, everything we do is fiber-based consumer packaging, which has got a really great sustainability story. So if you think about what we're doing in Kalamazoo, we're investing $600 million to build a brand new coated recycled paperboard machine. Um, and it's going to be the lowest cost, highest quality in the world. So I'm really excited about that in Kalamazoo. We already had a very good mill there. Um, this one really makes it, uh, you know, really one of the best in the world. And um, what we'll take is uh, the recycled material, the boxes you guys talked about that arrive at your houses or the paper cups that uh, you know get recycled. We can take all that material, take it to our mill in Kalamazoo and recycle it and turn it into a cereal box. You mentioned Kellogg's being a, a big employer up there in that area. They're a big customer of ours. And we make cereal boxes for them out of the recycled stuff that'll come out of Kalamazoo. So when you talk about the circular economy um, for sustainability, um, that's really what we're trying to attack and we're well positioned to be able to do it. Our employees are excited about it. The momentum in the last 24 months has uh, you know, been real and we're seeing it. And I, I think it's going to accelerate here through the next three to five years. I mean, people are concerned around their own health. They're concerned around the health of their family. And ultimately that translates into, you know, they're concerned around the health of our planet. And so they're making decisions around pr purchasing relative to brands um, that uh, are, are really doing the right things. And, and they're knowledgeable on this. They're much more knowledgeable than I was 30 years ago coming out of, of college. Um, and uh, they, they decide where they're going to spend their dollars based on who's doing the right stuff. And we're trying to help those brands with the packaging that we make, uh, you know, get the lift that they need, you know, to grow as well as, uh, you know, meet their sustainability targets and investments like the one we're making in Kalamazoo really help us do that. So the relationships that you're probably building are, are pretty interesting as you think about how uh, at my house, I got a ton of cardboard boxes typically from Amazon Yeah, uh, that uh, sometimes uh, most of the time they fit in my recycling, sometimes not all the way, but most of the time, but then they're going to have to get from my house over to your mill, right? get, get trans transformed, put into to a new kind of package, then off it goes again. Yeah. So you, you guys are having a really an interesting ecosystem that you're playing in. 
that's the whole circular part of, of the economy that I'm talking about here. And, and there's a market for those, those boxes that you're talking about. So when they're picked up at your house, they're further, you know, commingled with other people's stuff and then it's bailed up and by the, uh, uh, the waste waste Carthage company that that does that, and then we wind up buying from them. You'll also see things behind some of the big uh, stores, like Myers, good store up there in in Michigan. Uh, we buy their material in in the market and, and take it back into. You see those big bales behind uh, the stores. That's the type of stuff that we're buying from them and turning it back into useful products. And we can recycle these fibers, these virgin fibers, um, up to about seven times, which is really cool. Um, and we can make money doing it, which uh, you know is also really really, uh, you know, special and, and something that our, our customers really, uh, you know, uh, want and admire. Does, does packaging change? We talked a lot about at the beginning. I'm, I'm kind of struck by the difference between all of our conversation earlier around virtual yeah. and packaging being physical. Yeah. And do you, are you guys seeing differences? I mean, one, it sounds like, you know, consumers looking for sustainability, but as you think about shoppers going online or purchasing online versus in store, which is yeah. a different experience of holding a package. Are you are you guys seeing how that's impacting the the packaging that you that you do? We're spending a lot of time on that. Uh, it's a great question, Doug. I, I'll tell you. You know, prior to the pandemic, what we really saw growing uh, exponentially was the food service business, where consumers were going to what I'll call the perimeter of the store, the perimeter of the grocery store, and buying dinner for that night, and then bringing it home. Um, and center of the store was down. Pandemic changed that. Center of the store got real busy again because it was, you know, kind of the shelf stable type stuff. You know, we expect that to kind of revert back a little bit more towards uh, a normalized state. Um, Americans like to get out. Uh, they like to eat out. Um, and uh, we would expect, you know, some level of that to return um, for sure. And we wanted to because, um, you know, it's good for our economy, obviously. On the other side of things, there's going to be a bigger remote workforce. And that remote workforce is going to consume food differently than it did pre-pandemic. Um, and our customers really need to make sure, even if you've got direct delivery to the house, they have to keep that brand connection. You know, you think about that, uh, you know, you're not going to just sell, you know, something with uh, big black letters that says beer on it in a, in, a, in a corrugated box. That doesn't work, you know, if you're trying to, you know, build a brand, which is really hard right now uh, with uh, the multimedia channels that you have to go into to actually make that connection with the end use consumer. So we end up kind of being that vehicle that allows that, that marketing firm to take their product and brand it and wind up in the pantry, uh, you know, at uh uh, consumer's house. And, and that's really the role that we take uh, very seriously, kind of making that connection through that supply chain. Such a, such an interesting time for the, um, this online brand building. It just, it, you know, you think, oh, it's, we think about this a lot in education. Oh, it's, you could just take the, the in-person thing and kind of put it online, but it's yeah. like, no, like how someone picks something off a shelf in a store is different than how someone sees it in virtually when they can't touch it. Um, the, 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 the real differences there and, and being mindful of how that translates is, a, is an interesting, interesting question. It's hard to build a brand. You know, you mentioned, Doug, you're 38, I'm, I'm 54. But when I think back to, you know, when I was, uh, you know, coming out of college, there were basically three channels that, you know, had all the advertising on. It was ABC, NBC, and CBS. Now, you know, your cable provider, or YouTube TV, whatever you got, you got 2,000 options there. Um, you got to figure out how you're going to, you know, reach that end use consumer. There wasn't a smartphone. Now there's a smartphone where you get all your information from. How do you make the connection? There wasn't social media platforms. So as a marketeer, um, you know, your dollars only go so far. So you've got to have a product that at that point of purchase really makes sense to the consumer and they want to, they want to you know, put it in the cart or put it, you know, click it and get it in the basket. So the, the, and the work that you're doing here in, in Kalamazoo obviously is, uh, you know, a, a huge in, investment. Can you tell a little bit more about, you know, why you guys decided on Kalamazoo to, to pursue this and, and what that means to your company? So we have um, virgin paper mills, which means we take trees and, and turn them into a uh, paper board, which uh, uh, is used in folding cartons. And then we have recycled paper mills like the one in Kalamazoo. And the virgin paper mills need to be close to the trees because we don't want to transport the trees very far. And we tend to have those um, because we use softwood fiber. Um, they tend to be in the south for us. And so we've got big operations in, in um, uh, Louisiana, Texas, and, uh, and uh, Georgia here. Um, our recycled mills tend to be better in the Midwest closer to the cities where the, the material is collected. And if you think about Kalamazoo, it's almost halfway 
exactly between Chicago and Detroit, 150 miles this way, 147 miles that way. And so when we look at a fiber basket and, and not wanting to ship that stuff very far because it's expensive, um, Kalamazoo really winds up in a great location. Other thing we have, and a little plug here for uh, the Broncos is we've got a great university in, in the city of Kalamazoo. Um, we hire a lot of students out of the business school and out of the engineering school. Um, we actually uh, always have a number of interns out of the paper science school, uh, which is part of the engineering school uh, you know, at Western, and they've done incredibly well within our company. As a matter of fact, Kalamazoo is one of those cities where it's just hard to get people to move away from. You know, um, the downtown Kalamazoo has been great. You know, I, I think the, the striker uh, family's done an awesome job in kind of revamping the downtown area and uh, you know, our families that move there really, really like it. And, um, you know, so when we think about capital allocation and making a decision like that, which is a three decade long decision, we want to have it in a spot where we're going to be able to get talented labor, both hourly and salary. And uh, Kalamazoo is one of those spots for us. Go one That's more, a, Derek, uh, and then we'll go rapid fire. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead, go rapid fire. That's a great plug for Kalamazoo. I don't want to, I want to steal this shine off of that. So we'll, we'll leave it there. I, mean, I, I was gonna say to, I was gonna say to Derek, I was gonna say, you know, what, what you just mentioned, Mike, in our acquisition program, we always, uh, we're, we're helping aspiring uh, executives to, or uh, current executives to become aspiring owner operators and, and acquire a company and backing yeah. them uh, with a fund. And we always talk about the importance of having a, a great thesis on the industry. Uh, and, and the company, but also geographically. And what you just said is, you know, you know, kind of why is something in some place versus something else? And what kind of advantages does that give you? And Kalamazoo is that that equal point from Detroit and Chicago means something. Um, yeah, you know, strategic. It's really important. I mean, you got to know in our case, you know, freight is, you know, 5% of our COGS on average and, uh, and it's structural. You can't change it. Once you, once you put $600 million into the ground, it's going to be there. Yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's a big bet. Uh, and we're glad that you made that that, that bet uh, here in Kalamazoo. So to uh, wrap up here, Mike, we've got some rapid fire questions. Just one word answers. Are you ready to go? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Favorite leader? Winston Churchill. Courage or compassion? Courage. Speed or accuracy? Speed. Great ideas or great execution? Great execution. A word to describe your leadership style? Thoughtful. Are you a night owl or early bird? Early bird. Uh, brown or gold? Brown. <laughs> okay, and we're thinking. If we're thinking, we're thinking packaging boxes. Are we thinking squares or rectangles? Squares. Squares. Okay. Uh, you're about about ready to head into a dangerous jungle. It's a difficult business task. Let's call it a business task. You're going to go in there. Who are you going to bring with you? I'm going to bring people that are committed and willing to challenge. Okay. And then if you had a, a, a product, maybe a product in your product line that you'd want to take with you in a dangerous jungle, which is a business task, what do you bring with you? Corrugated box. <laughs> Excellent. And if you had an, an animal that really represented and embodied your leadership, which animal would you pick? Lion. Lion. Why lion? That was fast. Yeah. Just, you know, um, very um, kind of stately and, and uh, you know, just, you know, scrappy, I guess, more than anything else. Beautiful. Good. Well, Mike we, Mike, we really appreciate you uh, joining us on The Jungle. Great Bronco, uh, leading a fantastic organization. Uh, really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me today. I really enjoyed the time with you guys. Take care.